and you cut in from one end to the two inch mark, and then you go to the next line, cut in to the two inch mark, and you go back and forth, and it ends up a Z shape like this. Then this block of wood all of a sudden will make a cylinder, make an S out of it, you can open it up to make a whatever. Uh, this base was made out of a, a piece that was stood up and turned like this. You could open the top up and do whatever you like. That was my first airbrushing. The sun, my you wife. Turn it after you put it in a cylinder like that. This isn't turned. <laughs> <laughs> the sun is. Uh, That's the trick. The sun is uh, the same thing spread the other way on a hub of uh, yellow heart. And that sculpted the second way in the bandsaw. When you get all done, when you get all done cutting back and forth, you go cross-eyed doing this. It takes you 45 minutes to follow that little line. When you get all done, you stand it on end and cut the other way from both sides. Then when you turn this this way, you get a cylinder with that configuration. Or if you turn it this way, you get a different configuration. Okay? This is a prototype. There's all kinds of things. You haven't seen the last of this. You can go derivatives of this. Just for instance, you could cut the 3 16 lines this way and this way and open it the other way too. Okay? You can go nuts with some of this stuff. <laughs> anyway, catch it. Is the sequence important to do the long moments before you do the side contouring? Yes, because your lines are on the top. Your lines are on the top, on this, on the flat side. You could put lines, I suppose. Uh, could you account for the lines? Because I'm wondering about the stability of this thing, this how much waffly, and holding it on its bands on. You clamp uh, like a one by three on both sides of this. Okay. And that also holds it square. Yeah, okay. And on, on this one, it's, it's, uh, <coughs> On this one, instead of being straight cuts like this is, these are cut serpentine. So that when you open it up, you get the serpentine cuts. And then it's also cut on the face of it to make the front. Any cool. questions? There's just no end of the fun. <laughs> <laughs> You want me to do the other ones? I, I do. What kind of wood is that? That's, that was birch. These are birch, this is cherry. And does it have to be aged or green? Or? This is the first one I did. I think this is right off the lumber rack. Okay, this oh, is so it's kiln dried. Yeah, it's kiln dried wood. But uh, you can do all kinds of stuff with this. I mean, it, it just does anything you want. Um, Play music? Ever heard me play the accordion? <laughs> but uh, by sculpting different ways and by cutting, if you wanted to cut this in half, you could open this the, the second way too. But uh, you can go nuts. It could be steam bent. You could bend this whole thing after you've got it cut. You could open this up. Steam would take real easy to that. And then you could bend this with a third dimension. So, uh, and then when you opened it up, you'd have, you could open it this way and it would all open out. So, uh, cool. Me. Wow. I love Jay. Thank you. Want me to show the yeah. rest of something else? Uh, yeah. Just uh, about three, I think. There's a uh, threaded nut inside here, a little handle, and the uh, adjustment is a nut welded onto a, a T. Yeah, but how many did you have to make before you got the one that was good? That's the good one. <laughs> <laughs> the other thing you'll really like is a uh, number two Morris taper. They're hard to turn. And uh, if you make a jig, you take a block of wood and put a piece at the end of it. And then you take a number two anything off your tail stock or whatever, set it in against here, and put the other block against it and nail it on. Then you can put marks on here. This is two and a half inches. And this is an inch and a quarter, and you can actually uh, caliper this. So at the end of this, Morris taper has got to be 59 thousandths. So it has to start at 71 thousandths. And when you get all done, if it fits in there, it's going to fit in your lathe. You can put points, balls, squares, whatever you want on here. 
And uh, once you make one of these, you'll do all kinds of things. That machine also works for tapered tenons for stools and Windsor chairs. Yes. Very it's good. Yes, same thing. When you get all done with that, you make two of them, put a piece of corian on one, you put this in the headstock of your lathe, put this in the tailstock of your lathe, and it makes a pen press. Okay, you can press a pen real easily just by turning the handle and it just pushes the pen together. You don't have that big lever thing. At what, 3,000 RPM? Uh, no, more. <laughs> <laughs> this is to drill the, to drill the uh, hole in a, the big pen kind of thing. Uh, it just works real nice. You just push it back and forth, cleans it out. What kind of drill? Is that a different kind of drill? It's not a twist drill. It's a twist drill. Oh, it's been used, yeah. yeah. It's, not, it's definitely not a steel type, it's more of a wood type. So, okay, next, next up, uh, we want to do Jeff on this end and work down the table. I'm also in a paint laboratory. Um, my favorite is this rig, it's called a chain clamp, Fisher Scientific. I don't know what kind of clamp they call this, but it's right out of the catalog. And what I've done here is put pieces from a wet vacuum on it. You take a piece of plywood and a piece of galvanized pipe for your stand. Bring this in behind the lathe when you're turning your bowls and starting to sand. Get this right up into the, in the back side of the bowl. It'll suck all the sawdust out. I mean, I don't have to wear a dust mask when I'm sanding anymore. It all goes straight into the wet vac. Rotate it for spindles when I'm inside a bowl. I'll clamp this down on the front of the lathe table, use the crevice tool, literally put it right inside the bowl, I'll sand down on the bottom, and I don't get any of that sawdust packed up inside. Um, the rest of it is homemade jigs for sharpening. Um, I didn't make my one-way grinding jig, but the rest of it is easy enough to do. And if you look at this drawing, or this picture rather, again, I'm in very limited space. So I took the Black & Decker Workmate knockoff and a tabletop a little bigger than this and I screwed U-channel into it. You can see what I've done in here. Set the Workmate up, put the tabletop on, turn the cranks, it's locked in place. I'm ready to go, it takes about a minute. When I'm done with it, turn the cranks, take the tabletop off, the whole business will fold down, sit at the end of the bench and it takes about that much space. Cool, Thank you. Who's next? Uh, the it's just a leveling foot. You can get it Lowe's anywhere like that. It's threaded the same as the metal stoppers. So when you pull it off of your, however you're holding it on, whether it's homemade like Frank's over there to turn your stoppers. Just screw that on there, the stand's there. If you're spraying finish, you can hold on to it. If you're bill buffing, it gives you something to hold on to to do that. And it'll stand up while it dries. Thank you, Dan. Scrap exchange is where women buy uh, material and stuff. So <laughs> cut it up on the band saw and use it to put stuff on with. And this is uh, uh, just one of these little string things. And, I use a lot of uh, my tools have the, the uh, screws in the end to hold the tool in and I can have this on my desk. So how many do you wear at once? One will do it. Oh. <laughs> all of them are the same size. And this I just, I'm sure all of you keep a little bit of sawdust around. I've never had anything break or crack yet, but should I? <laughs> I've, got, I've got something to fill it in with and this just is a nice handy thing to store it in. That's easy. Okay. Um, I have three items tonight. This is a caliber, obviously, but it usually comes two foot long. And they're pretty useless unless you're, uh, you know, to handle this at two foot long. So I simply chopped it off at nine inches, and that seemed to work really well for most things that I'm going to do tenants. Uh, it's easier to handle. I'm not worried if I drop it. I, I rounded the points. Uh, if you're doing a tenant, this works excellent. You put it right down on the chuck, measure the tenant, and then you can put it on your wood. Of course, most people that use these with the lathe turning 
hold it um, on the back side and don't put your thumb in front of it because if something catches, it can really hurt your thumb. So that's how I'm told to use it. So why didn't you sharpen the point? Why did you uh, I'm not turning with it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I use the points to dig in. There, there you go. Well, oh yeah, if you're doing this type of thing. Yeah. Yes, yes, okay. If you're trying to mark it, that makes sense. Um, this is more, I use it for tenants and, uh, and things like that. Yep. Okay. Uh, this is a very inexpensive, I call it dibbling, uh, uh, Frank is, where's Frank? All right, you might like to try this. It gives a little, a little rectangle versus a dot. And it, it, it looks more architectural in the sense that you have all these little rectangles. Now, this was a very inexpensive to build. A store that I was at in Murphy a couple weeks ago had these Emery Cutter refills. Uh, normally on their pegboard for $249. Uh, they had them on sale because they were going out of business for a buck twenty-two each, and there's uh, four cutters. So I got an extra cutter left over. I put three on the jig. I bought a uh, three-eighth inch deep socket, a six-point deep socket, and then used the cutoff wheel to cut out the guts of it, and a 20-cent bolt. So I think this was well under five bucks and probably less than 10 minutes to build. So what kind of cutters are those? Uh, they're sold at Ace as a refill for an emery cutter. You know that big heavy steel handle with the cutters on the end? I think it's for dressing an emery cutter. Oh, yeah. yeah. Right, right. And they sell them, I'm sure you can buy it on their Ace website or most stores. At the regular price, it's still a bargain, $249. But this turned out to be even better. I left the bolt because I found I could steer it better. And when I turned it side to side, I got a good grip on it. Uh, uh, and this is just a extension. So you can make different extensions as well. So the socket idea worked out real well. This is probably my best idea. Um, this is a magnet and a valve. The valve opens and closes very easy just by turning the dial. So you hook this to your air compressor stick this on your lathe bed anywhere you want it to be, and then put this on your tool rest. Uh, either under it, to the side of it, on, uh, on the, um, the supporting arm, uh, on the banjo, wherever you want, and you can spray a little bit of air into the hollow form, the bowl, whatever you're doing, sanding, keep the sawdust from blowing in your face. Basically, since you have precise air control and a flexible hose, it doesn't get in the way. And this is what supports the airline. Now, in my shop, I have an airline going to this that's teed off my main system, so I can turn this on anytime I want just by grabbing this. This particular magnet is really strong, so it's going to stay wherever you put it. And I put a tie wrap here that you can actually angle this in different directions. So not only can you stick this wherever you need it on the tool rest, you can angle it. And you could probably put other little things on it if you wanted a hook or something like that on it as well. But it's basically to keep the shavings out and not be starting the lathe off and on all the time. That's it. Thank you. Variable speed angle grinder would work really well. Turn this, this way a little bit. This one's oh, about 140 bucks, different places, 2,800 RPM to 11,000 RPM. And the trick was to find a router type collet <coughs> with a quarter inch uh, opening so that I could use the power lock sanding system. And that's what this sheet does. It's henrytools.com out of Ohio. And for one that fits the spindle, um, quarter inch, heavy duty, it's like $47 plus shipping a couple of years ago. For the spindle. Just for the spindle. So for 200 bucks, basically, uh, I got a real nice sanding system and it's taken all the aggravation out of sanding and actually made it halfway decent proposition. I go with the power locks to about 180 grit and then I switch to these little foam pads and work my way up to probably 600 and then I go, um, I go <coughs> with hand beyond that if I'm going beyond that. So 200 bucks, it's a, it's a nice fast way to set your sanding system up. Thank you.
It it's better if you're back. Winter 2003. Just, yeah. Step up. AEW yeah. magazine. And what you do is, yep. theirs was a little more mm -hmm. complicated, but I thought yeah. a plastic pipe was easier to work with than I had it around. Uh, you level, this laser matches to the point of this. And you use this little level to tell when it's level. You just press the button, it tells you exactly where the bottom of your bowl is. Or you could use like on a hollow form, something deeper, and it'll tell you exactly. It's sort of like, uh, this was the bowl. Here, well, it makes it you know. <laughs> Orland's going to be a lathe. This is the bowl. That would be the bottom of the bowl, where it is. Does the laser go through the wood? No. Oh, wait, we're shining. We're shining. Yeah. 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 It's just a, one of these uh, pointer lasers that you use that I bought off of eBay for three or $4. Dollars. Or you can get them all, get them at uh, Lowe's or Home Depot for, you know, a couple bucks. Go put a cash register in Harbor Freight for like two bucks. Uh, Harbor Freight has them. Yeah, everybody has them now. But, uh, and the level, you know, gives you your accuracy on it. Definitely look for laser pointers that use two triple A's yeah, that's versus those used. watch cells. Because mm -hmm. there's a big difference in cost between yeah, triple A's and watch cells. batteries. Yeah, so I just got a sheet of plywood and I put a map on the floor and it just basically formed up the sides and you know something like this in a catalog would cost you a hundred bucks probably if you could find it. So anyway, it's uh, you know some of the I like to do some big pieces that come up and they're enclosed but they're open and so to go in you have to have the, the width but then you want to get down to the base or the lower third of the piece. So I just made that. And it's very easy to make. You know, longitude and latitude on a map, on a floor, you can just get some plywood and, you know, jigsaw, jigsaw. Yeah, I mean, two sheets. Two sheets. The map two sheets. Yeah. Yeah. Is Raleigh to Chapel Hill? Or What's that? Which map? Um, <laughs> <laughs> Raleigh, of course. <laughs> And I just, I think I made one, I think I made one, and I just traced, I just traced it. So I made one and then put them together. But it's, this has been really handy. Uh, one issue, I like to do the uh, detail at the bottom, the base of a piece, to do a nice uh, little ring or something for a foot. And I do some platters and some balls that have flair. If you have a ball that, that comes like this, or a plate, you can, use this, these are uh, reversing jaws, and this is an Axminster chuck. And it basically has concentric rings, and I can put a piece in here and squeeze, squeeze down on it. And um, this, I mean, I just glued up some two by fours, so eventually this will just be all cut down, and then I'll make another one, because as I change sizes of pieces, you know, I'll get rid of this, and I just make it to suit. Hopefully, I can use this size oh, for a number so of pieces. So the reason you made it so big and thick, yeah, so, so you I could change it. Yeah, so I can just keep cutting it. Uh, it's not a fixed. It's not a fixed design. Every different piece, I might need to cut another something in here. Right. And I just have a little sharp tool. Over so if it got all beat up, you could turn yeah, it and then I just, again. Yeah, these are just mounted on uh, on jaws. These, these just come with a the chuck. They're reversing jaws, and you just make your. Uh, your edges. You make make this. I have a couple with solid wood, but this is so handy because you can just finish a piece, put this on, and just I put a like a shop towel, a blue shop towel here, just so I don't mark the piece, and then I just clamp down until it's snug. I don't really clamp too hard until it's snug, and then I have full access to the bottom to finish turn the bottom, and I just pop it out and it's done. There's a lot of issues when you mount that thing on the truck. Pardon me. When you, when, no, no, I'm not, when you when you get the chuck, you get the jaws to, to do you any alignment issues with that? No, there's a little bit of instruction. Basically, you just mount, you just you just create a, a, a big square like you would a rough blank, and you just mount these on the inside corner, gotcha. and then you turn it, and it, it centers it up. And then I, I put them kind of halfway in the uh, concentric rings so I can get a good movement. 
And then I just turn my rings inside. So you could technically take a big square piece. Yeah, you, you could take a table saw. Or yeah, you could take a, a square saw a nice piece, square. you could glue up uh, two by fours or any type of wood just to basically mount them to these jaws. Well, I mounted this whole thing solid at one point, and then I put it on a bandsaw, and I cut the cut it. Then I mounted the individual pieces. So how close do you have to match the groove to the rim on the bowls? Well, it, as I turn these, it does match it exactly. So once I mount well, these, I think, it, I think it reusing a groove from prior use. Yeah, because this this new bowl, do you have to you have to recut it to match that. Big sometimes, post? yeah, that's a good question. Sometimes, if it's if I can't get a good grip on it, I might need to. Because you may just get you know four bands around each right. of those. And right. Is that bad? Well, it needs to be snug. Yeah. It needs to be snug. So there's there's a, there's a good reason to recut it to match it pretty close. Yeah, exactly, because it has to really snug. But this has a pretty good latitude in clamping, so I have a good half inch that I can. So move. even if you didn't get it perfectly square, right? As long as you're not trying to close it all the way, right? It doesn't matter. It's not it doesn't matter because when I create these rings, it's perfectly centered. Right? So I could put I could put the tail stock snugged up into the last minute. Keep the tail stock snugged up until the last minute. Yeah, if I'm not confident that it's really going to grip it or if it's not on a piece, uh, I might bring the tail stock up and pin it until I take off what I want to take off until I get a little nub. And I may even leave it on there and then take the nub off with a little carving tool and then hand finish it. But usually you can clamp down hard enough where you can take the tail stock off and finish the base without the tail stock support. So, anyways, this is a really handy tool, a really handy jig. I definitely use my jumper belt a lot, but this would have even more flexibility yeah, because you cut it, cut it to what you need. Yeah, yeah. It's, I can turn this down, I just glue up some others, and make and make other jobs. Right. The price is right. Yep. The price is right. Yeah, yeah. by fours. <laughs> <laughs> okay, who's got the next jig? This is something called a, a Longworth chuck, and you can Google Longworth chuck and find directions online how to make these. Similar to this. Um, uh, if I'm doing a small bowl on a, my mini lathe um, and want to finish off the base to it, um, I use this. Uh, jumbo jaws cost, what, $80, $100, something like that, thereabouts. I made this for you know, some scrap wood. I would guess if I spent $5 on it, it was probably a lot. So the idea is that after I've rough turned the outside and then uh, I'm going to borrow this from whoever this belongs to, but uh, I've done the outside, done the inside. I want to finish the, uh, the inside, uh, I'm sorry, finish the bottom of my foot over here. I can slide this, turn it around, and it moves to, I guess, infinite size. Get it to the size that I want, tighten it up. Lock everything up in the back over here, and now I can finish turning my foot. So similar to jumbo jaws, the um, thing I don't like about jumbo jaws, and the fact they cost eighty to hundred dollars, is that you quite often have to move the little knobs, and this gives you infinite variability. So use it with my mini leg. Probably get a bigger version like that. <laughs> Yeah, you could. Yeah. Yeah. What's that? How'd you cut the slots? Um, cut them the same, at the same time. Uh, quarter inch plywood, a piece of MDF on the back. Um, With a router or what? Use a router. I uh, made a circle making jig on my uh, router, uh, for, so a circle making base. And I think what I did, I, I made this many years ago, but I think what I did was I just took, um, uh, made a cross, and then drew two circles, and where the outside circle met the cross, I use that as a point, so let's say it fell right here. That would be my pivot point for this right here. Okay. Came around here, and then of course pivot point here would be for this one, and so on. That okay. makes sense? I did yeah. yeah. okay. um, Did the whole thing in an hour and 15 minutes, hour and a half, maybe. Uh, so. I don't think we're just right. What did you use for the rubber uh, your uh, These are rubber, uh, yeah, these come out of um, uh, the hardware section over at Lowe's. 
I think I paid 70 some cents for the year, bottle stoppers. Um, I'd actually, uh, uh, solid bottle stoppers, I'm glad you mentioned that. So what I did uh, at home was uh, I just made, a, again, a little jig where I um, took a block of wood, uh, drilled a, a larger hole, didn't go very deep with it, a little smaller diameter hole went deeper and so on, so I could wedge this in there, took it over my drill press, and that way I was sure that I was drilling straight through it. And um, I went all the way through it. On your lathe too. Yeah. What's that? You could do it on your lathe. Drill it on your lathe. Probably could have done that. Probably the plugs you use for a pool for winterizing. Mm -hmm. Perhaps I don't know. You cut holes in it with a with yeah, that on the back of it, and you spray them out. Probably a number of different rubber things out there. Yeah. yeah. I heard that uh, wine bottle corks, the uh, composite ones, were good. Did but you have to drink the wine. <laughs> There's an advantage on a different day. <laughs> I've actually used the wine bottle forks and I do a real nice job. Right, right. Nice and soft and, and work well. Also, I had a face plate from my mini lathe, which I never really use because my mini lathe, I always use um, uh, my uh, talon shook. But um, I figured since it was sitting around, I could permanently attach it and I can very easily put it on the lathe. Thanks, for uh, back a few months ago, I, uh, I asked a question. I, I, a lot of the wood I use is uh, punky and uh, soft to the touch, and uh, so you try to put it on your uh, plant and it would, it would squeeze the wood. So someone suggested to put like a piece of maple or a piece of oak or something on the bottom. I've used it, I love it, because I can reclamp um, on, like let's say I took the bowl off on the soft wood, I couldn't reclamp it and get it on. This is much more stable, so uh, I don't know what happened to this bowl. I think its foot fell off and I ground it off and put this on and then started again. So it saved the bowl also. So, so are you using super glue or hot super, glue? Uh, CA. CA, uh, okay. That stuff is, uh, I don't know how to get it off, but uh, but anyhow, it's worked real well and I've done on some pretty good sized bowls. Then you just trim it. I just cut the, just, you know, cut it off. It worked real well. So it saved a, I use a lot of really ugly wood or whatever you call it, but not in good shape. But uh, it just doesn't have any strength to, to lock it, so this yeah. worked. Good. That's it. Go ahead. If it's, it's a mini lathe, it's, it's all scraps of it. Probably more expensive than a pack of uh, sandwiches than the rest. Uh, but I needed this sander, I didn't have one, and I saw this plant for one, I said, oh, I can get that. So, and it works great. Um, now we got a bigger lathe that's pretty much, my mini lathe is pretty much dedicated <laughs> dedicated to this. It, uh, uh, I, I even had some of the 5 8 inch shaft in my bag of spare pieces of metal. So it to oh, the is camera. It, is it just drilled in there, or is there more Thank to you. it? Thank you. It's just drilled in there. Okay. I put a washer there in case there's any wear. Turns out there's not, so that wasn't really needed. What do you use this for? What are you, what are you, what are you using that sander for in your shop? Like any other disc sander? I've got some special use for, for, I use it for contouring things, uh, off the bandsaw, trimming them up. Um, you want to turn up, uh, sand up a point or something, uh, who knows what. Uh, this groove fits the, uh, the miter fence of my bandsaw, which is right next door. So if I want to uh, trim an end at the right angle, I've got that gauge to the Or uh, uh, shops. Segment. <coughs> yeah, I guess you do. I don't except do segment. You set the angle and measure it in. Yeah. It's a big selling point on a shopsmith that they have a big disc and a, and a flat table and a lot of ways to use it. So there's. I like I like free tools. <laughs> nearly free seconds. <laughs> well, I'm up here. Let me talk about the other one that I brought. This is a, 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 a steady rest for my, my power attic. Um, I always wanted one. Didn't want to spend the what hundred dollars for one. More than I saw I saw this plan in some forum somewhere, and so I made one up. It's all again, except for the hardware. It's all free, and these I got from uh, inline uh, roller skate uh, at the used uh, sporting goods store. So I've got eight of them, and I got enough to wear out. 
forever, I think. Um, <laughs> it, it works great. It, it fits the fits my farm mag just right. Of course, it's got to be tailored to the ways you lay and, and the height. Uh, but those are the only really two dimensions and how big you want this to be within reason. Um, I put two here because I wasn't sure how stiff it needed to be. But one is probably sufficient. There's not a whole lot of side forces on it. Uh, so that's probably over the over building. And this kind of fits through the ways and I can turn it and tighten it up. I uh, have to fish for, for loose what, sauce fruit. What size is the power mag? 20 inch? It's, it's uh, 20 inch. And that's about? So what? this would be 10 inches from 10? Okay. this surface this surface here to the center. Now how many, <coughs> has that ever been too small or do you find that that works for most pieces? Well, uh, I, I don't think you, I don't often have the need or probably will have the need for a large diameter where it's long enough to need a steady rest. Right. Yeah. I find it really handy for things like you wouldn't imagine, like you've got even so something short, yeah. but you want to be able to hold it at a weak point, like say a bottom of a hollow form. Right. You can put it up near just to make sure that you don't uh, risk rip it off, rip it off or, or, or disturbing it in the chuck. Right. Even though you don't need it for the length, you need, you need it for some, some side support. Um, I found that the, uh, the gum rubber won't mark, won't mark anything. Oh, Whereas so. the black ones might. <coughs> uh, that's show that's show the camera the base of it and how it attaches. This? Yeah. Uh, the cap a little longer. I put it down through the through the way here, okay. rotate it, and then draw it up. <laughs> that happens. So that I don't have to oh, so pick up the pieces the like I'm doing now. You don't have to slide it in from the side, it goes through. Yeah, it goes through this way oh, and rotate it, pull it up. Yeah. It, does, it turns out it doesn't need a whole lot of width in this direction. It just needs to be able to pull it. And you finished it so prettily. All it is is varnish. <laughs> I know, but it, you know, everybody else's is just rough wood. <laughs> it's something I do. It's pretty. <laughs> Thanks, Bob. Thanks. You want to go next way? Yeah. That doesn't matter. My name is Don Lydon. There's a collection of tools here. This one, I think, this will win probably the ugliest tool award, but it works. It's just one of those uh, texturing gears that you can buy separately in a catalog. I had some, this was all together. This was probably at one time, I don't know even what kind of tool it was, to be honest with you. But it was laying around the shop, just drilled the hole in it, put a bolt right in there, it spins perfect. It's ugly, but it works. And in fact, that wild looking piece over there, could you pick that up for me? The box elder with the, yeah. There's texturing on that, and that was done with this ugly little thing. So it was only, I don't know what they charged for wheel, maybe what, $10, $15? If you bought that tool, it sold it to be $189. Right, for, this, <laughs> for the complete system. Yeah. So, one of my old grandfather's tool gave so to me. This has a bearing. It's, it's, the wheel has yeah, there's a bearing in there. It's yeah. the That's right. It's like it's like and it's smooth right. as silk. Right. It's great. Yeah. So, I did that. And there's another one here. Actually, a friend of mine made this. This is just a drill chuck. And it will hold either round or I put a square stock uh, piece in there just to show that it will hold that also. And you don't have to worry about chuck key, you don't have to go while you can tighten it just like that. And you can use replaceable whatever you have laying around within a, within a certain range. A little simple little handle, drill a hole, put the chuck. Laying around somewhere that will work with. There you go. And it'll hold. Most people have, a, have one of those drills that had batteries in it. Battery cost more than the new drill. I got yeah. one of those. So my sister got it for Christmas for me. <laughs> as soon as Don showed me that, I discovered I had two of them. <laughs> one of them made one of those. Yeah, it came out perfect. How do you get the chuck out of those kind of things? You just like, tear it apart? So, uh, uh, I think it was. Well, wait, they don't screw it. It's got this. It'll be a couple of times. They don't screw it. Some of them are pressed in, and you can just. You know, pound it out, right, Frank? <laughs> As he did today with one of them. Look in the chuck. The cheaper ones for a hair Right, I can right. Tell you, I, I pried the whole thing apart, and it was all the way back. I literally used the size off, just cut it off. This particular one here, 
Just screwed off of whatever it was on at one point. So hence, put a bolt in here, and you got it. Some of them will have a, a taper piece. You might have to drill an oversized hole to fill put it with epoxy or something. But whatever you have. The better drills, because the reversible might be tapered, might have a screw in Open yeah, from all the way what was yours? Inside. Yeah. It was reversible. Yeah, I don't know. Was it black and black? Yeah, an old drill. Yeah, yeah. It was, and, and it, it wasn't, there was no screw inside or anything. So, so is that a piece of the private department? No, it off or had about no a key or anything? That's just hand tight? Inch and a half. Yeah, you, can't you don't have to worry about the key. Yeah. It's not going to go anywhere. Yeah. It's just stable, just like that. So it's and simple. This one here is another uh, simple little tool. Uh, this was a homemade piece of bar stock. This is this is not what I'm bragging about here. You can put whatever you want in whatever tool you want on the outside. This is one of those aluminum uh, ferrules with Allen wrenches that tighten this up, to tighten the tool up. And you can drill right through the handle and this will disappear right into it if you have a, a straight piece. But the thing that I'm always worried about is I'm always losing the Allen wrenches. And it annoys me when I don't have something right there when I need it. So I went overboard and it uh, I have an Allen head wrench in the bottom here that I drilled a hole in. You turn this to the side, it kicks out the Allen wrench, which is held in there with a little magnet. And now I have it all tightened up, <laughs> put it back in there, handy dandy little Allen wrench holder. Huh. Or as Frank says, Don, you've got too much time on your head. <laughs> <laughs> so that's that one. And last but not least, I play the drums also. This is a drum cymbal stand. But I wanted to sand inside hollow forms. And I didn't want to pay $125 for those sanding ones, uh, ones that you can buy. I think it was a sanding glove or whatever. Uh, so I cut off one of the top of my cymbal stands, not one I was using. And what's nice about this is <laughs> I keep hitting it and it's gone now. There's nothing but air there where my cymbal used to be. But this adjusts inside any hollow form you want to get in. This moves by centrifugal force. This is just a store bought, you know, one that you would buy to put in your drill. What I did was I put a bearing on the outside here and a magnet again, I love magnets, right inside the little hole. So this snaps, I don't know if you can hear it, but it snaps in there with the magnet, turns around with centrifugal force when you press inside, and you can go just about any angle you want to with this thing. You can almost go backwards on it if you want to sneak inside and get behind something and smooth it all the way out. And this spins the whole time. I don't use it for outside stuff. It's not something that I use every day. But for hollow forms or something long where you can't reach in there with a drill, the drill isn't going to go in inside a hollow form. And a lot of times you can't even get your hand in there. But you can get this in there and press them along the side and go nice and smooth. And you get a nice smooth hollow form. That will work even if you're reversing, right? No, yeah. 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 Just spin the other way. Right? As long as you yeah. hold the force against it. It's bad. And that's it. Very simple. It uh, costs 25 cents. You buy a 3 8 inch bolt, uh, inch and a half at uh, uh, Lowe's or Home Depot, and, and you put it in a piece of wood and you got yourself a bottle stopper jig. One of the things that's nice about this is that I do a lot of uh, multi axis turning, and so when I'm doing bottle stopper uh, jigs, particularly when I'm teaching, students don't have necessarily number one jaws where they can take a small piece of wood and move it. You can use this uh, to do multi-axis because you can then put this on a number two jaws and then you just tip it. You do your axis and you rotate it, tip it, rotate it, tip it, and you end up with the multi-axis and it costs you 25 cents. And as a, I have instructions if you're interested in building it, uh, on my website uh, there's a handout on how to build this thing. It's very, very simple. Thank you, friend. Who's next? All right. These are uh, some of my jam chucks for when I'm doing hollow forms. Most people, when they'll do a jam chuck, it just covers the rim of the vessel. But a lot of the vessels 
This is a small hole. Sometimes I'll do vessels that have large holes in the side. So if you just put a jam chuck up here and try to bring your tail stock up to the bottom, you're going to crush the piece. So what I do is have a couple of these around. This goes inside the vessel. They're undersized, and then I just wrap masking tape around it until it gets a snug fit. This way I've got support in the bottom of my vessel so that I can do my bottom work, either put a bottom on it or in this case, take the bottom completely off. Um, when the tape's on there, you've got enough support that actually I can, I took this completely down to nothing and the tail stop was stopped spinning with this going uh, and no, no problem with the vessel flying off. How do you display a piece like that? Well, stand? this piece isn't finished yet. It's going to get a, a stainless ring around the top partially and then there's going to be a, a vertical rock uh, with a hole drilled in it that holds the stainless rod and this will stay suspended off the table. So keep them in different sizes. Leave the tape on. I've three different size vessels have been on this one. Sure. If you have one, just you know, if it winds up being a little too big, then pull the tape you put off. Put any kind of padding on the actual end piece. No, no, because it's inside. No one's. Well, gonna... I'll sand it out later or yeah. something else. But no, you know, it's not going to freeze bad. Thanks, Greg. Who's next? I'm Ted Pruitt. I'm about three months into my excursion into wood turning. And uh, if you look in the dictionary under cheap, you might find a picture of me. <laughs> <laughs> um, I wanted to get something to sharpen my gouges up, and I found this in a, a book that uh, my fiance gave me. And I just knocked one out. I spent about a dollar putting it together. And uh, it works pretty good until I can afford the, the real thing. And uh, if you're a beginner and you want to try and make one, I've got some sheets here. You're welcome to take. Some extra copies. Thank you, Ted. Mm -hmm. That's great. Excellent. Yeah. We've got some on the back. <coughs> he was here a couple years ago. He's having everybody draw out golf balls <coughs> so he can hold stuff on the lathe. And I'm wondering, you know, most of us have these uh, one-way bearing centers. They come with this big cone that we look all throw aside. And you can put the cone on this way, and it will hold your goblet. Don't need the golf ball or the tennis ball that people use. Mm -hmm. Turn it the other way, and you can do that thing that uh, Duxbury likes to do, where you can trap stuff. You know, you got two cup centers. So that works. So don't forget you have that. And then one of the things uh, Jim Duxbury demonstrated this a couple years ago is I put this one in a chuck. This one goes on, on the, uh, whoops. Didn't bring my Allen wrench. I should have one of those fancy jigs. And this goes on the uh, tailstock, yeah, and one you can put a rectangular piece in there. Or if you uh, your cylinder popped out of the lathe, you can stick it back in between your centers and kind of sand it and finish it. Uh, it also works if you want to use it as a cup chuck for a sphere. It works for that. It's a handy little thing. And then, uh, once again, Mark St. Ledger had this guy making these things. If your jaws of your chuck are too big, you turn one of these little skinny guys, put a foot on it, face off that face, put it in your chuck. Well, actually, you put it in your chuck, face it off, then you take it out and you cut a notch out on the bandsaw. And then you can take your little cylinder and tighten the jaws of the chuck and it'll hold it in. So you don't need to buy extra jaws or if you're kind of... Mess up? No, you don't. So that's cool. <laughs> <laughs> and I guess I got plenty of time, so I can go through all my jigs. You guys, you guys get bored, let me know. <laughs> this is an idea I got from uh, Dale Nish for doing massive quantities of birdhouses. You got a little tent in here, a little tent in here. You go into your birdhouse blank. You drill your uh, your your hole. Uh, in this case, I'm thinking it's an inch. Oh, it says one inch. I drilled a one inch hole in here and I left it on the bottom still having a little bit of that one inch and then at the top it's one inch and then I hollowed in between and then that way when I want to do the bottom I stick it on there and I got myself a jam chuck and I can totally finish the bottom. And because it's missing in here it doesn't really get jammed on forever. If it does get stuck on you take it off your chuck, put it in your microwave when your uh, better half's not looking 
and just cook it for a, you know, a few seconds or so and we'll dry it out. No. Hopefully it'll come apart. Uh, it, doesn't, know. it doesn't always work. <laughs> and then this is a jig that I uh, got the idea from, uh, once again, Dale Nish, but also uh, Joe Bradshaw for putting your roof of your birdhouse on it. You go ahead and have your birdhouse and drill your hole to your inch and a quarter diameter, whatever the outside of this tendon is, hollow it out a little bit, then you pop, kind of rough shape, and pop it off, and you stick your roof on this guy, and you can completely finish your roof and then come in and drill your little hole for your uh, eye hook. I don't have any spare roofs right now. I didn't have time to turn them in today, so I can't show you how that works. Maybe one day I'll demonstrate it. Then when I, when I finished my globes, for my hollow, uh, for my hollow globes, in order to put finish on them, because I like to get finish on right away, I have a, I have a board with nails in it. I put a nail hole in the bottom of this peg. Then I can spray it, or dye it, as you can see, whatever I want to do with it. And then I stick it on the nail. Try not to stick my hand on the other nails. And I get a whole bunch of them that way. That way my fingers don't rub it up. And then, I a lot of these. This is for uh, finishing my school seats. I can spray all the way around. I have a little Lazy Susan at the end of my bench, so I can spin it on the Lazy Susan. It helps to have a tighter tenon than I have, because when I spin on the Lazy Susan, sometimes <laughs> it starts spinning, so it kind of works against me. What are you going to do with the center hole? And then with the center hole, because I like to do finials and stuff, I usually turn a little button that has a 3 8 inch tenon, and I pop that in there and have a little button. And if you want to see how that looks, I have two stool, three stools at the uh, Clean Scores uh, Wonk Gallery. Are you Chris? You have some stuff in the Wonk Gallery, and they've been trying to get a hold of you. Did they get a hold of you? Oh, good. I thought you looked familiar, but I wasn't sure. And then uh, this is just a normal jam chuck. Now, a lot of times it's nice to make these out of green wood because it will <coughs> rip your, your sphere a little bit better. Uh, but sometimes... If you go to lunch and you come back and get out of green wood, it's permanently stuck. This is Soren Berger's uh, little, little goblet. Well, actually, it's a, scoop. it's a scoop. And we went to lunch and we came back and you couldn't get it out. I get to keep it. I should have had him sign it. But, uh. And then this guy is for my, uh, when I do my Ikebanas, and I have the hole for the little uh, Kenzin that goes in there. I can stick it on there and I can finish all the way around in one pass and not have to do two, two setups. Once again, it goes on a lazy Susan. Well, I got plenty of time. And this is similar to what Chris had, but I, I used uh, MDF instead and I just make a jam chuck for the reverse turn of my balls. If I have a straight edge on it, mm -hmm. if it rolls over like most of mine do, it won't fit in here. I didn't know you did balls. <laughs> I burn them sometimes. We just cross section. And then, and then this is just a little jig for uh, doing your pepper mills after you've drilled your hole. I'm not, oh, actually, I think it's supposed to go this way, but this guy's shrunk. Okay. This guy is really handy. It's actually from your furniture stuff. This is usually used to check your uh, square on your drawers. But I found in my stools it makes it real easy for me to stretch the legs and stretch it out. And then I can measure how long my uh, stretchers need to be for my legs. It would work for winter chairs also, not just stools. Is that some kind of hardware you buy, or is that? Yeah, these are Veritas little things. You get them from the Lee Valley catalog. $180? No, I think they're like a couple bucks. <laughs> no, and then you make the sticks $8. yourself. <laughs> you can make these sticks however long you want. They're probably 14 bucks. Yeah. <laughs> you have to ask Bob Gunther. He bought them for me after I lost mine. And then uh, Frank and I one day went to the plastic place over there off of Highway 70 near where I live, and we asked permission to go dumpster diving. We got pieces of plastic, and I drilled a 5 8 inch hole, and then I just turned a little flat there. And once again, that's for you know trapping stuff between centers. And I made one out of wood. does the same thing. That was before we had the plastic. Plastic is better. And then, if you're going to want to be cutting your cylinders on the bandsaw, you want to use a, a V-block. This V-block is too small for this piece. But you never want to try to cut a cylinder straight on your bandsaw because just like you have to get a catch on a bowl when you're 
you don't have that supported edge there, you know, not supported. Well, when you're going to come through that band so I can get to that unsupported part, this thing goes flying. You either bend your blade or snap your blade or threw your hand into it. But if you use a V-block, it tends to work much better. I mean, I had several V-blocks at home. I mean, I still got more junk. Oh, this guy does double duty. When I do my uh, duster brushes or basting brushes, I can stick them on here and I can spray them all around one go. I'm a Yankee, so I reuse jigs. And then, of course, there's the uh, legendary spindle turner story stick. Probably works with bowls type stuff and bases if you want to do that. Repeat, repetitive stuff. I'm getting close to the end, and that was a sharp bit. Not anymore. If you ever want to do a tapered hole in something, you can take one of these uh, spade bits and grind it to whatever shape you want. Uh, when George Hatfield was here, he showed he ground it a certain way and it actually stayed on center and bored a nice, perfectly true hole. Couldn't remember how he did it because I was off doing other stuff at the time. Well, we also do it for the candlesticks. Yeah. yeah. You know the candlestick shape, the taper on yeah, the bottom of the yeah. candlestick? Yeah, I'm getting to that sort of thing. That's okay. my next one. The other one I did is I do those seam rippers and they have a tapered hole. Oh, wait, no, that, this is one for the seam ripper. This is a tapered hole. That makes sense. And then, I'm not sure what this one was made for. Uh, I haven't used it in a while, it's a but it's got, it's got a stepped, stepped hole. Hmm. I'm not sure what it was for. It. No, it's kind of small. It's 7 16 so I'm not sure what I was making. <laughs> Can't remember. I'm an old man, and I haven't used that in a long time. And then, uh, these are uh, parts from a cotton picking machine. And you can get them at a flea market, and I need to find some more. But somebody from Alabama gave Frank and I some in Mike Mahoney's class, and I ground a point on it. What was it, eight years ago we went there, seven years ago? And I haven't had to sharpen it since, and it's very, very sharp. This is very, very hard steel. What do you use that for? I use it for doing, uh, when you do your crosses, and you need to put your little dimple in. Just as a center punch. Oh, okay. Just for a center punch. Oh, okay. Except they don't punch it. You just make a little dimple. Works great. I still got more. I'm running out. Then, uh, this is that jig I made when I first got my Wolverine. You know, it's an inch and three quarters inch hole. Put your gouge in there. I decided a long time ago I don't like that because it starts <laughs> digging deeper and deeper and can't really see what it's doing. But when I was making tools, especially a box cutting tool out of 3 8 square steel and some other tools, I use this to hold the steel up against the grinder so my fingers don't get burnt. I'm not the grinder, my belt sander. I have a sanding station for when I do my box cutting tools where I have to cut back on one side for about four inches. You got to cut it back about five degrees so when you go in with the box tool, it doesn't grab. And I use this to hold it on there so I don't burn mm -hmm. my fingers. And I also have a notch for a quarter inch piece of steel. So I mean, I, I didn't want to throw away, throw away no, so I could be double duty. <laughs> and then a long time ago, when Frank and I first took a class with Alan Batty over there in Utah at Craft Supplies, we were trying to figure out how to make the Wolverine jig grind the side, grind on the gouge the way Alan Batty wanted. He wants the side wings to fold in a little bit so that when you roll it over to scrape on those wings, you have enough steel there so it doesn't get dull. Most people, when they use those jigs, the side wings are pretty straight up and it's a real thin edge. So we played around. We made this little guy. To, somebody's got a jig. Yeah, sure. And you put this in your little steel rod that comes out. Just put that in the bucket. And that's why this is notched so it doesn't slip in the bucket. Then you can extend your, your arm. Oh, okay. So you get higher up on the wheel. Sometimes uh, you cut, you grind it too close to the center of the wheel. You never want to get below the center of the wheel, and this guarantees you're up higher on the wheel. So that kind of comes in handy, and I lose it every all the time. I have one you made for me. Yeah. I, I, this has been lost for about four yeah, months, and I finally found it. And oh, one more guy. This is one of those Morse taper things, and the jig that uh, Jim was kind enough to show us the easy way to do it, uh, Morse taper. This goes in your headstock. You can do whatever you need to do on this end to put something on it to turn it. Oh, wait, I'm not finished yet. Oh, wait, there's more. There's, there's more. more. 
on my on my drill press at home, I have a fancy version of this, which it has a piano hinge too, but it's got a mic like at top, and it's got two T tracks in it, so I can put little little uh, lockdown things. But it also will adjust. But I still have these same cheap cheap two by fours cut at an angle to get the different angles for my stool seats for the legs going in. I've drawn a center line down here so I can line up the center of the drill bit with the center post of the leg. And then when I put my seat in there, ooh, look. I've got lines, guidelines drawn on the seat. And I set that in line with the center line. That way my splay is always the same. It's a little trick I learned from Windsor Chairs. And so I have different different uh, wedges for different heights. And I've got little, little places for... Uh, bolts to go in to kind of keep the wedges at the same right distance so it doesn't slip. And this is the one I take on the road with me. Didn't work in Kansas City because guys in Kansas said they had a tabletop drill press. You know, it claims where they have tabletop drill presses are about this high. You know, they're just a half version of the full stand <laughs> ones. Well, they had a tabletop <laughs> one, a little miniature one. I mean, I don't. We just barely got these little tiny stool seats to fit in there. And I said, "Whoa, that's not what I thought." <laughs> uh, so, I think that's all I got. And I probably got another couple dozen jigs at home, but I, mean, I don't know if they do anymore.